Dark Side of the Ring this week was Extreme and Obscene, the story of Rob Black's XPW, Extreme Pro Wrestling. They have really gone in heavy on the deathmatch stuff this season with the Nick Gage episode, Onita and FMW, and now XPW. You had Rob Zakari, better known as Rob Black, who directed porn movies, combining his love of porn and pro wrestling together to form XPW in 1999, which clearly borrowed from ECW, the spirit of ECW. It served as something of a West Coast version of ECW, based out of Southern California. I didn't watch XPW back then. I knew of the New Jack Vic Grimes scaffold match, and I vividly remember reading about the Messiah incident. Uh, both subjects are covered on this episode. Black was not interviewed for the show because, as Messiah, I think it was, uh, said, it's a no-win situation for him. He really doesn't have anything to be gained by agreeing to be interviewed for this. Instead, he recorded his own podcast talking about the show and rebutting some of the things that were said about him. They talked about some of the really stupid shit that some of the XPW guys did on their shows. Luke Hawks did a 450 off a balcony through a table with thumbtacks and the tacks were just buried so deep into his skin he had to use a pair of pliers to pull them all out. Another time there was a, an infamous flaming table spot where someone brought a charcoal fluid to the show. They went out, they were supposed to get lighter fluid. Instead they got charcoal fluid, which is oil-based. Lighter fluid is, uh, is what they usually use. It burns up real quick. And Supreme, who was a, a legend in deathmatch wrestling and a big star in XPW, he, he died of a heart attack last year, he ended up on fire. And they have this footage of him running around, rolling out of the ring on fire. Flames are on him. And he's running around the ringside area screaming. He's just agonizing, trying to put the flames out. His flesh is just all burnt up and it's, it's hanging off. It's just disgusting. They mentioned that Rob Black had struck up a deal with Paul Heyman to bring ECW to the West Coast. But when ECW got national TV on TNN, all of a sudden they didn't have a need for XPW anymore. And this did not sit very well with Rob Black, who held a grudge. And this eventually led to the little XPW publicity stunt at ECW's Heatwave pay-per-view in 2000 which they held in XPW's backyard, Los Angeles, right? ECW went out west for the Heat Wave show. Several XPW stars had seats in the front row that uh, Rob Black had bought for them. He bought like hundreds of dollars, I think, worth of, of tickets for the front row. And so they're sitting there and they caused a commotion at the start of the main event between Tommy Dreamer and Just Incredible, and they were all ejected from the building. So they're out in the parking lot. A giant brawl breaks out. They didn't even get into the specifics on the episode, but a lot of uh, fans knew that there was a fight going on outside, and so they ran out to go see it, which kind of killed the main event that was happening in the ring. New Jack on the episode, and, and, and boy, are they lucky they interviewed him when they did. He talked about being out there in the brawl, and I think he had just had knee surgery or something, so he had a crutch, and he's beating the hell out of one of the XPW ring crew guys with a crutch. The following year, ECW folded, and XPW brought in some of their big names, like Terry Funk and Shane Douglas and New Jack and Sabu. All New Jack wanted to do was make money and watch porn. So he was more than happy to go work for XPW, and he claimed that Rob Black actually let him ride a forklift around his warehouse to help grab all of the porn DVDs that he wanted to watch. Austin drove a Zamboni to the ring, New Jack drove a forklift loaded with porn. Sounds about right. They covered New Jack's scaffold match in XPW against Vic Grimes. If you missed the New Jack episode of Dark Side of the Ring, he and Grimes had a match previously in ECW where Grimes landed on New Jack's head on a balcony dive spot. He hesitated at the last minute. He didn't want to do it. And New Jack said, motherfucker, you're coming down with me. And they come off and Grimes was a big dude and he landed right on New Jack's head. And he fractured New Jack's skull. He had vision loss and it was a, a very bad injury. And New Jack never forgave him for that. 
And actually, I think he totally lost the vision in one of his eyes. He never forgave Vic Grimes. So he had nothing but revenge on his mind from the day that he got hurt. He was out for blood. Rob Black is the one who came up with the idea of matching them up in a scaffold match. And he wanted to flip a coin to decide who would get who would be the one to be thrown off. And New Jack told him point blank, he goes, Grimes is going off, regardless of what the coin flip says. He's going off. I'm launching him off that scaffold. And they showed this scaffold, and it's, I mean, it's way up there. And it's swaying back and forth. And you don't have a lot of room to maneuver when you're in one of these scaffold matches, which is why I've never been a fan of them. New Jack, in the middle of it, pulls out a stun gun and uses it for real on Vic Grimes. And then he grabs him. And you remember what New Jack said, bombs away. He throws Vic Grimes off the scaffold. And that Vic Grimes bump off the scaffold is still the scariest bump that I have ever seen in my life. The man was inches away from death. If he had just landed over a little bit more, he'd have splatted on the pavement and that would have been the end of him. As it was, he somehow crashed through all of the, the, or some of the stacked up tables that were in the ring, bounced off the top rope, and landed in the corner of the ring. And New Jack said when he got to the back, Rob told him he thought it was great. He gave him a bonus. And New Jack felt, well, I got my revenge, so mission accomplished. And that was his last match for XPW. Mission accomplished actually isn't accurate. His goal was to kill Vic Grimes. He he has said he wanted to kill him. He didn't want to hurt him. He didn't want to maim him. He wanted to kill him. He was aiming for the ground. So in that regard... He failed. Rob Black uh, does not come out of this looking good, but, I mean, all you need to do is read up on the guy. There's there's no way he wasn't going to come out of this episode looking good. Luke Hawks told a story about Black chewing him out backstage at a show for putting his hands up to protect himself on a chair shot to the head. And he said, we don't do that here. Which Black adamantly denies on his podcast. He says it's bullshit, that never happened. To that, I say, let's just ask Jerry Lynn, because Luke Hawks in the episode says that Jerry Lynn was right there when it all went down, and Jerry Lynn pulled him aside and told him, hey, look, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's saying. Ignore what he said. So let's ask Jerry Lynn. Jerry Lynn's working for AEW these days behind the scenes. If Jerry Lynn says that it happened, I will take his word over Rob Black's. And according to Luke... Rob got back at him the next time by booking an angle where his hands were cuffed. He had him, uh, I don't know what he was hanging from, but he was cuffed. His arms were outstretched like Jesus Christ. And Black told, now this is him telling the story. This is Luke Hawk's version of the story. He says that Rob Black told Supreme to destroy him with chair shots to the skull. Now he's cuffed, so he can't protect himself. And they had the footage and they showed it. They showed, it's just, it's sickening. That was his punishment for daring to protect himself by putting a hand up on a chair shot. But the most insane story is the Messiah story. And it was great that they got Messiah to be interviewed for this. Uh, Obviously, he's retired. He's not wrestling anymore. He's got a, a wife and a family now, kids. He was their top star at the time. Very young, early 20s. And there were rumors about Messiah hooking up with Rob's wife, Lizzie Borden, behind his back. And Rob wanted to kill him when he found out about it. He was so livid. That spelled the end of Messiah in XPW. Now, he claims he got a phone call later on from Rob, warning him that he had three days to get out of town, or he was a dead man. And Messiah told him, I'm not running. I'm not getting on a bus and going somewhere. I'm right here. I'm not going nowhere. So, Messiah works a show for Epic Pro Wrestling in 2002. New Jack actually worked that show that night also. He was shooting on Rob Black and XPW. And in the course of his shooting, New Jack mentioned that Messiah slipped Rob's wife the ding-dong. Later on, when Messiah came out, he is showered with chants of, You fucked Lizzie, you fucked his wife, and Messiah, being young and dumb admitted it publicly for the first time. He had never responded, or or in interviews that he did, he denied that there was any truth to any of this. 
So this was the first time that he admitted the fact that he had sex with Rob Black's wife. He responded by saying, and she fucking loved it. Because up to that point, he had always denied it. But he said, I'm not going to be intimidated by Rob Black. That was his mindset. That was his attitude at that time. I'm not going to let this guy and his threats and his phone calls intimidate me. And Messiah got a little full of himself. Messing around with another guy's wife, I mean, let alone your boss's wife, is a pretty fucking stupid thing to be doing. I think we can all admit. There are no innocent parties here. Everybody comes out of this looking scummy. A few weeks later, there was an XPW show forever forever known as the Beach Ball Show. It was a terrible show. The crowd just completely hijacked it. There were beach balls being bounced around all over the place. And Messiah attended the show with a friend. Rob Black didn't know this. When things started getting out of control, he decided to leave. But word got back to Rob that Messiah was there. And he was furious. And what happened next was crazy enough that it ended up on an episode of America's Most Wanted. Less than two weeks after that show, Messiah had just bought a Nintendo GameCube. And he was at home, he was playing the video game. Two men walk into his apartment. They open the door, they walk into the apartment. He didn't think anything of it at first because he had a, a roommate. He just thought that they were friends of the roommate. So he didn't even bother like turning around to see who it was. In fact, he said that he just kind of looked over and said, oh, hey, what's up? As soon as he saw, though, in the reflection of the TV, one of them locking the door behind him, he knew something was up. He goes to turn around. They immediately grab him. They take him. You know, they tackle him to the ground. One guy has Messiah in a chokehold. It's not applied very well, but he's trying to choke him, or at least subdue him in a chokehold. The other guy grabs Messiah's right hand. He pulls out a pair of garden shears, and he proceeds to cut off Messiah's thumb. It just popped right off. And they reenacted it here in this episode. I don't... <laughs> that was... That was something else. They tried to cut off his other thumb. They were reaching for the other hand. They wanted to cut off the other thumb. He balled his hand into a fist, so they couldn't get to it. They grabbed a fish tank in the apartment and smashed it over Messiah's head. They were trying to knock him out. I mean, they knocked the guy out. They can cut off pretty much anything they want. Instead, he, he staggers over to the front door. He can't open it, though. He can't unlock it because he doesn't have a fucking thumb. He's just kind of pawing away at the door. and There's blood all over the door. Now, he didn't mention this in the episode, but he did tell America's Most Wanted in 2002 that his thumbs were not the only part of his anatomy that they tried to cut off. They tried to get his pants off. And while he cannot be sure what they were trying to do, he can't say for sure, it sure sounds like they were hoping to cut off his dick. Which, if you think about it, I mean, given what given what he did, I mean, that kind of would make sense. If, if somebody did send, you know, these two guys after him to punish him for something, I'm just saying, to punish him for something, that would seem like something that uh, you might want them to do. He claims that he managed to get an arm bar on one of the guys and he got the door open somehow and then the two guys ran out. Uh, I remember reading that he was stabbed multiple times when they couldn't get his pants off. So it's like how he would then have been able to get an arm bar on one of the guys, that I don't know. That that almost sounds to me like that's classic kind of wrestler embellishing there, but I, I don't know. He was searching around for the thumb after to try to put it on ice to try to save it. He couldn't find the thumb because they took the thumb with them. To this day, the case is considered unsolved. They never did find the thumb. They never did identify the attackers. And nor has Rob Black ever been arrested or charged in connection with the attack. Obviously, he denies having anything to do with it. I mean, look, you can make up your own mind about whether or not he had anything to do with what happened, but it's never been proven. Black and his wife ended up going to prison. Not for that. Didn't have anything to do with that, but... They went to prison on obscenity charges that were tied to the distribution of the adult films that they were making and that they were selling that depicted simulated rape scenes, among other things. He was all over television during this time doing interviews. I mean, on like mainstream network television, Nightline and, 
you know, all these different shows defending uh, the movies that he was making and his right to them and, and, you know, First Amendment rights and that kind of stuff. And he was daring the Attorney General, who was John Ashcroft at the time, he was the Attorney General of the, of the U.S., and he was basically daring him to come after him and try to stop him. Not a very bright move on his part to challenge the federal government and say, just bring it. Well, guess what happened? They just brought it. They came after him and they ended up getting him. And he and his wife were facing up to 50 years in prison, potentially millions of dollars in fines. They each ended up serving a year and a day behind bars on one, I think it was just one charge. He and his wife split shortly after they got out of prison. Today, he's married, he's got a few kids, he's running a cheeseburger shop, but he's also promoting a rebirth now for XPW. And they're running their first show in New York on November 7th. They're holding an eight-man tournament to crown a new XPW champion. And they have some names that they're advertised. I mean, some names for the show. Rhino, Brian Cage, Willie Mack, Matt Cross, among others. Uh, so just like Onita, he too resurrected his promotion this year. Onita brought FMW back as FMWE doing exploding exploding deathmatch uh, stuff in vegetable markets in Japan. And now XPW, he's going to give it another go. I guess what's old is new again, it seems. But that was basically the crux of the entire episode. I mean, it was, it was an extreme deathmatch promotion that pushed a lot of boundaries, that incorporated a lot of sex appeal, a lot of sex, period, uh, but the Messiah story to me was always the craziest thing I've ever really associated with XPW. This Thursday is the season finale covering the steroid trials for George Zahorian and a fellow by the name of Vince McMahon. Saving the juiciest for last, I see. And I'll have a review up for that at some point next weekend.